Hello and welcome. My name is Narani Nimpuno and I'm the Head of Global Engagement at Lynx and I'll be moderating today's session. So welcome to all of you. I hope we get an interactive session with lots of questions as I know this is a topic that interests a lot of people. So the Lynx Distinguished Speaker Series is a series of talks gathered here at Lynx with experts in the industry who often have deep knowledge and a unique perspective on a particular subject. And today's speaker is no different. We have Jane Coffin from ISOC who will be speaking about community networks. So Jane is Senior Vice President of Internet Growth at ISOC. Um, the Internet Society's Internet Growth Project Teams uh, are focused on community networks, internet exchange points and interconnection, peering and community development, as well as a new critical project on measuring the health of the internet. Her work also focuses on access and development strategy, where she and other ISOC colleagues and partners focus on coordination of collaborative strategies for expanding internet infrastructure, access and related capacities in emerging economies with partners. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to Jane. Thank you for that introduction and thank you to everyone that's joined here today. We're gonna to speak to you today about the power of community networks. Um, community networks are networks that are from the community with the community by the community, um, built at the local level um, to connect people who are unconnected and to connect people who don't have a lot of access. And sorry, I'm just starting my watch, my stopwatch here. Um, we have been working with people from around the planet, like this fellow, well, through partners with this fellow in high mountain uh, parts of Greece, to um, Argentina, to Kenya, to Tanzania, to South Africa, to the Republic of Georgia. There are many unconnected people on the planet right now, and we really are dedicated. Our vision and our mission is that the internet is for everyone, open, globally connected and secure um, infrastructure. And this project on community networks is a real testament and you'll find a lot of similarities to the internet exchange point community. It's a testament um, to the power of local innovation, empowerment, but also to the partners that build these networks um, who work with local governments, um, who learn new technologies and are being trained in certain capacities. Before I really get started, I wanna thank Lynx, it's a great partner. And again, to uh, thank Isarantaporo, one of our partners um, for the picture here. As you know, um, many of you know, many of the places around the world are not connected. Um, I found this frame highly compelling that you're seeing right now. This is the first clip you would see from a video from the New York Times. It's about the project we are working on with our chapter in Georgia, with the ISP Association in Georgia and with the Georgian government. That $40,000 investment into the people of a high mountain range in the part of uh, Georgia called Tusheti has led to USAID, the World Bank, the Czech Development Agency and other partners coming in looking at this small project and saying, can we scale it? How can we work with you? It brought in more, more partners from the Georgian government as well and allowed us to get some spectrum, them actually, the spectrum to um, provide the networks in the regions that they're um, rolling out uh, infrastructure in. We're talking about high mountain networks like this, where those horses help bring in the solar panels and equipment, actually some uh, masts and towers, uh, that you see there to build the infrastructure. Um, colleagues that you know, like Jan Zortz, who um, used to work with the Internet Society, were up on those high mountain um, ranges, actually tweaking solar panels, um, hacking a fix so that the, the grid could be powered up there. But literally, these are communities that did not have access, who now are using that access for socioeconomic development, small um, Airbnbs, more products that they produce being sold in Tbilisi. This is just one story among many around the planet. And we were pleased, by the way, that this article was not in the travel section, but in the business section. Community networks are not insignificant. They may be small, but they are important 
parts of the internet. And as we all know, small, medium, and sized networks build the infrastructure that we now call the internet. We don't want single points of failure. We want more infrastructure developed. This is how we do that in certain places that just don't have that connectivity. I'm going to describe some of how we do this at the Internet Society, and I'm gonna talk about some of our partners. And I wanna be clear that when I speak about our partners, I'm not speaking for them, but with them. And I've actually cleared some of the data that you'll see at the end of this presentation with some, some of our partners. Um, so again, why are we engaged? Half of the planet's not connected. Um, socioeconomic development has been proven by not only the World Bank, the International Telecommunication Union, um, organizations like GSMA and other, that connectivity does lead to socioeconomic development. It also leads to opportunity. I will note that during COVID, we have seen such a big gap um, highlighted, amplified by many around the world, and people are taking a hard look at the policies and regulations that they've had going for years and years that really haven't um, done the job. These are people who, uh, this is, we're talking about people who go home to try and teach their kids um, more about educationally. They can't do that if they don't have the internet or a good connection. We're seeing this in New York City. We're seeing this in rural, remote and underserved areas around the world. So we're not just talking about small networks in the high mountains of Georgia. We are talking about networks in New York City in a mountainous plain in Greece, um, in Seattle, in the United States, um, in the Eastern Cape, in South Africa. So this is a quote from one of our colleagues at the Association for Progressive Communications. Dr. Carlos Ray Moreno is a good colleague and has actually done a lot of work with us um, on studies about um, community networks. We'd be happy to make sure we get those available to those that are interested. But community networks are networks built, managed, and used by local communities. This is very important because some communities decide that they want to be in charge of their infrastructure because they never were given the opportunity, A, to be connected. They have felt um, disenfranchised or left out. And they want to build this themselves so that they are building from the ground up grassroots. Some are coming in from large cities where they want to interconnect with another network to get better connectivity for a school or a shelter um, where people are living during COVID and or in general circumstances. So again, networks built, managed by local communities. And for those of you that work closely um, with the United Nations or focused on the sustainable development goals from a CSR perspective, a corporate social responsibility perspective, there's a widespread recognition of the opportunities and the potential benefits of expanding access to the internet. So when we spoke, uh, Carlos and I and some others at a UN meeting a couple of years ago at the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, we focused on the importance of this angle with the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, because there's something in it for everyone, <laughs> whether you're a UN official, a local government official, uh, a local chief, in a village, whether you're in Sub-Saharan Africa or tribal communities in the United States or Canada, we are working with communities like that to build more infrastructure. And many are connected to IXPs. So I just wanna frame this around some of the work we're doing. Um, we have different projects and one of them is community networks under the portfolio that I help manage. And the team that um, is responsible for community networks includes a colleague that many know from Lynx, Michuki Mwangi, Sally Harvey, but it's led by two project leads. And I would be remiss if I didn't say the two names out loud, Max Stuckey and Juan Pirano are two of the folks inside our team that are working with a global network of experts from ISOC, our chapters, folks like you at Lynx and around the world. So I just wanted to say that we frame our work in work streams and one of our work streams is community networks. We have a global and a regional approach and many of our partners do too. You can't scale the work that you do if you keep it just at a regional level. You have to bring this up to the global level. That means speaking at regional events and regional um, governmental organizations like something called CITEL. Um, turning off my phone announcement, sorry. Um, and it also means working with organizations like the African Telecommunication Union to scale the work. We need to have government officials buy into what we're doing. Um, and what the community networks are doing. Some people, when we were at a large treaty conference several years ago, thought the community networks were rogue networks, that they were terrorist and not friendly, seriously. And we thought, my God, how has the narrative gotten so off, off, the, off the topic that people think that these are not good things to do? Because who would think that not connecting people is a bad thing? 
Right now, what we're seeing during COVID too is that government officials are scrambling. Campaigns and elections are being based on connectivity, broadband um, connectivity and connecting their people. Government officials are taking a look at their mapping. They're realizing that the mapping they have done is flawed. If you say you cover one household in a 10 by 10 kilometer area and say that all those people are covered because you've covered that one uh, community, that's a bit flawed. And we actually see that in the United States where some companies can say that just because they've covered one household that they've covered the whole area. That doesn't mean people are connected. So what we're trying to do there is work with other organizations to say, really, let's map. This is a critical issue. People need to be connected. They need this for economic development. They need it for emergency services. They need it to educate their children. So why not have alternate forms of connectivity? So we see community networks as a complement. They're not a threat. So this is an important thing for people to focus on from um, the perspective across the planet. Again, these are some of the places we work. We have staff in many of these regions or we work with partners like APC. I mentioned them earlier, the Association for Progressive Communications or A4II, it could be an IXP. Um, it might even be a local government. It just depends. Not every, every community is different. It's almost uh, again, like internet exchange points. There's certain similarities that, that define an IXP. There are certain similarities that define community networks, connectivity, local, working with policymakers and regulators to get them um, allowed or permitted and um, other factors like that. But it really depends on the local community and finding that champion. It could be the local electrician. It might be the local chief, as we mentioned, like we found in Zenzeleni, which is in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, a project started by Dr. Carlos Ray Moreno, who I mentioned earlier, but you will find that there are different flavors. And so really it is about empowering that local community to develop something they can sustain. The sustainability factor is so critical and it's different around the planet. And again, it, it, the factors also include how they can get funding, who they can get grants from and how to actually run a project, how to manage the money. You don't wanna ever flood too much money into a community network to start because they may not be able to handle all the funding that would be coming in. So like internet exchange points, community networks um, are bottom up. We call them the, the from the community with the community by the community or for the community with the community by the community. And again, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Rajnesh Singh, who's a good colleague and friend from the internet society. Raj helped us get started almost 12 years ago. Um, we started off with a, a typical internet startup mode. Raj and another colleague named Osama Manzar from the um, Digital Empowerment Foundation in Delhi, India, literally sat down back, back of the napkin, started to scope out what it would be like to bring more wireless connectivity into the um, unconnected regions in India. That's a big task, of course. So they looked at this from a small micro level and how they could scale it at a macro level. And it was the training with partners, empowering the local communities, community to community knowledge exchange. And a key ingredient, of course, are local champions. The two photos you see here are one from um, Waimanalo, Hawaii, where there is an indigenous community that we've helped connect. They've taken a small Wi-Fi mesh network and connected to a submarine cable. So there's backhaul through that cable out to the broader quote internet. This fellow at the bottom is in um, Kyrgyzstan. We took that on um, a site visit when we were out. Uh, this is about three hours outside of Bishkek. So you can see the range of where we are and where we're working with partners. Community networks come in all shapes and sizes. They have different setups, different purposes and different governance models. Um, from the size, it can be 50 people to 50,000. 50,000 is more of the scale of Guifi.net, a network in Spain and Europe that in near the Barcelona area that has um, paved the way for many other community networks. So a shout out to Guifi, Roman Roca, who is one of the founders, um, Leandro Navarro, who's a colleague that works with me in the IETF, um, IRTF group to talk about research and, and other ways that we can support more networking. Um, those are some of the people, professors, uh, Ramon was at Oracle, um, who found that they needed to find local solutions. So um, on different setups from a technical perspective, voice and SMS only in some communities in Oaxaca, Mexico, Wi-Fi only, depends on where you are. That is New York City mesh for right now, from what I know. Um, again, mesh networks, municipal networks, different purposes. People want access, people need to be empowered, improve affordability, greater openness and autonomy. Um, 
the different governance models. Some are nonprofit, some are quasi corporate, some are small business, some are NGO based. It just depends. Um, but those are some of the flavors of what you might see in the different governance models. We see four stages of development and deployment that sort of back up the work that we do in our work streams. So it's engagement, meeting with people, just as you might do at a, a EuroX meeting or an IX uh, local association meeting. Um, you bring people together, usually at the request of the community, we'll work with them. We don't try and go places we're not asked to go, or we might be asked to come in and partner with another existing partner. Then we're looking at the policy and regulatory implications. We do a bunch of training where we might be looking at training the local trainer. Really the most critical thing that I've seen since I've been at the Internet Society is sort of this unbelievable formula for success where you're training local people to train local people. It's not an empty aid promise where I've seen development projects uh, that tried to sort of come in and sort of tell people what to do and that doesn't work. <laughs> that's not sustainable and that's not empowering the local community to do what's right and what they know will work, which is really the formula for success. Deployments usually come after that training, but sometimes it might just come after engagement if you've got a really um, switch, switched on community that knows a lot about different technology or they've done a lot of training with other partners. So this is a circle sort of that we see of um, the goodness of the wholeness of where we focus, but any of these can be switched around in this, uh, this diagram um, for how we engage. The pillars of community networks, as I mentioned earlier, you have a policy and regulatory focus. We really are looking at trying to work with governments for favorable policies, uh, for making it simple to start a network. There are a lot of barriers, as many know, who do networking, whether it's trenching fiber or putting up a tower, um, Example for you, we had a, a, a communication from a colleague in um, an African country who came to us and said, someone wants to charge us $2,500 a month to put some of our receivers and transceivers on their tower. Can you loan us, grant us actually $2,500 because we wanna buy a mask, that's what the cost is. And I said, okay, I'm not sure why, why. This, is our, this is really easy. 2,500 to help you build and empower your own local network where you might be charged 2,500 just to put up infrastructure. Infrastructure sharing, something that regulators take a look at is a really important issue to focus on and for countries to start to think about how to roll out networks faster, whether they're a small community network or helping a data center get their infrastructure rolled out there, favorable policy environments, enabling environments are critical. This means a lot of work on our side and with our partners sometimes to speak with governments so they aren't threatened by the idea of a small bottom up network. Really, this is about change. This is about changing the way people look at policy and regulatory environments for universal service funds, for funding of networks, for licensing, speeding that up, making it faster, making spectrum unlicensed because it's so much easier to roll out an unlicensed network as long as you've done the groundwork. And um, also I mentioned spectrum, it's the S word. Some people dive under the table when we mention spectrum, but it's critical. We have to change the game on how spectrum is allocated. Um, we're not talking about wholesale changes to new poly, uh, to governmental systems right now, but we are talking about ways that we can loosen up the spectrum allocation and assignments. Um, backhaul, critical. You've got to get the, the bits out from the village uh, or from the co community out. That means um, access to fiber or favorable ISPs who are willing to uh, connect, uh, take the traffic out and interconnect. Interconnection, as many of you know, critical word for everything we do with IXPs, critical to community networks. Knowledge and know-how, hyper important that we're empowering the local communities, users. There needs to be a critical mass of users willing to help sustain that infrastructure and that network. And sustainability, critical, critical. We don't go in not to empower a community. You go in to work with that community, find out ways to help them at whatever level of expertise they are at and or educate them and introduce them to other community networks so they can get their off and running. And sustainability also means funding. Some communities go grant to grant to grant. That's exhausting. Um, it's also not necessarily a formula for success where you, where you um, are always looking for more grants. And we've often tried to find um, a charging model that works, even though they're nonprofits or NGO type networks, they definitely are not, um, they do have business plans. And I think a lot of people 
um, think these networks are flaky and not sustainable, they're very sustainable. Um, it's just getting from startup phase to more advanced phase to more um, on their own phase with respect to funding and maintenance and tech and um, wherewithal. Sorry, just hearing the oops, not working. Sorry, my presentation froze, there we go. Some of the places on the planet where we work, as you can see here, um, across the world. Um, I won't get into the where yet, we're working on the mapping right now and getting uh, more data in all of those little nodes that you see, but you can see it's not just in um, developing countries, but it's also in the US and Canada with tribal communities. These are communities that for many years, tribal in the United States, I misspoke, First Nations in Canada, there are a lot of communities that are not connected and or have been ignored um, on the connectivity side. It's complicated as they say. Um, Partnerships are important. This is a picture from one of our appearing in interconnection meetings. And many of you know that young man in the picture, that's Nishal Goberthan, who works with um, Packet Clearinghouse. It's people like Nishal that make IXPs run and develop them and create them from a sustainable factor. And Machuki, who works with us as well from the AFPIF side, take those people, think of them in the community network side, and you jump over to exactly the sort of work that we do from the bottom up with different companies, with different governments, with different nonprofits and with community networks. Um, another aspect of the partnership is the um, funding equipment and coordination. Um, I mentioned funding earlier. Funding has usually been done at very high levels of billions and millions with some development agencies. There are conversations going on right now with entities like the World Bank, um, the African Development Bank, um, with USAID and others to take a look at smaller increments of funding so that the communities are um, running through a process of how they sustain themselves. We also work with our local chapters. We have about 120 around the world. Some of them are looking at running um, community networks themselves. Governments, as I've said, like the UK government has an excellent um, Spectrum team at Ofcom. They're actually uh, a fan and a promoter of community networks in some of our international meetings. The South African government is doing a lot as is the government of Argentina. We saw Mexico pave the way with something called social purpose licensing and allocation of spectrum directly to a network in Oaxaca, Mexico. And a shout out there to the community called Oaxaca uh, in Oaxaca called Rise America and a team there that we work with called Redis Comunica. So there's a big global group of humans around the planet working at all different levels to try and make community networks work. I'm gonna speed up here. We've got about three or four more slides. During COVID, people have asked us, gosh, it's hard to roll out networks. You can't get to certain places. You can. Uh, we don't personally go anywhere. We're not allowed to right now, but our partners can work in our regions and we can provide them with lots of um, funding where they can go buy the equipment that they need in order to do what they need to do to build out those networks. So from New York City to Greece, there have been um, networks rolled out. Georgia as well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna go through our huge list of different partners and where they're working, but just know I'm gonna give you two snapshots of New York and Greece in a minute. But our partners have been working hard in this picture, you, this is from Waimanala, Hawaii again, they've been working on capacity building, community building, policy engagement, outreach, and uh, we've got some policy recommendations that we've put out during COVID, but we also have policy recommendations that have come out of our tribal community summit called the Indigenous Connectivity Summit. So those are being socialized uh, around the US and we're, we're using them as a baseline with some discussions that we're also probably going to be having with the Federal Communications Commission. We're really looking forward to that. Change has to happen and COVID has been an amplifier of the gap in connectivity, but it's also been, I hate to say this, one of the best marketing tools I've ever seen. Um, so sorry about that, it's my timer. New York City Mesh, they've deployed 262 new nodes since 11 February, 2020. I can't tell you what the demand has been like. Take a look at their stats page. They've done incredible work. Um, yesterday, I was talking to Scott Rasmussen from New York City Mesh and he told me that via email that they had just connected a shelter as well where a three-year-old girl had just gotten online for the first time um, with her mother. So this takes and hits people at all levels of all economic levels in cities and in rural areas. And you can see by the chart here where the different, um, the scope of the network development at New York City Mesh in the last year. It's pretty amazing. They also have a GitHub site with a lot of information about how they got started um, if you need to take a look. Sarantaporo.gr, 
Um, CN numbers today, I just got this data today from Vasilis Huisos, who is one of the um, champions working with local champions. And I've been to this village, uh, one of these villages, they've got 12 villages, 24 fa farms and one camp, 43 back, uh, backbone nodes, 71 point to point connections, 130 access points and 84 active local community members. What you don't see are pictures like of, of um, some pensioners actually crimping wire. And what I did see in this village is that there is a renewed interest in bringing um, connectivity to dirt certain areas from an economic perspective with the farms and an agricultural perspective, but from a human perspective. I stayed at the house of an elderly couple who told me that they wanted to bring the internet to their home uh, so that they could actually have their grandchildren come back to the village because there are a lot of children and their parents who live outside in more urban areas. And what has happened and what we've seen here and you, the picture that you'll see after this is of one of the pensioners who's standing on the roof installing um, um, an antenna. There is a renewed sense of purpose in this village and these villages. Um, I, it was pretty exciting. I call it the community, uh, the human networks that build the net nets, um, a human chemical reaction as well. When you see people get together and are excited by something that they can do at the local level, these, this community also backhauls out through a university. So I wanna give a shout out to research and education networks as well, who help connect um, unconnected uh, networks that are out in local areas, bring their backhaul through um, the university. So this picture is also in Sarantaporo where you can see that the person here is installing more equipment for the network, one of the nodes. So this is the work that's ongoing right now and throughout last year. So it's really exciting to see what we can do remotely with people and what they're doing at the local level. So it really is about that local empowerment. I believe I'm at time. So thank you very much and apologies for the alarms that were going off. I was trying to keep on time. Over to you, Narani. Thank you so much, Jane. It's, it's, uh, it was a fantastic presentation of, about a very fascinating topic. Um, I have lots of questions for you, but I also see that there are questions from, um, from the chat. So I'll start with those. So James Higgins is asking, is, there a, is the Starlink better version an option to connect in rural areas? Yes, it is, it could be. Um, I don't want to go too far down the road on conversations that we've had with some people at Starlink, but I do know that they're talking to people in different communities. There's a network in Washington state in the United States called Althea, who I think is talking to them about what it would be like to explore uh, a partnership. Um, I think Starlink is definitely an option. You'd have to take a look at the economics, but I think it could be something that um, we would want to do a beta on with Starlink if they wanted to work with us and others. Absolutely. And those are lower. Thank you. And I see. Yeah, sorry. Right. Thank you. Uh, and I see Philip Rushton actually had uh, the question, one of the questions that I had as well. So an interesting presentation. He says, what do you see as the main barriers to community networks? Thank you, Philip. Um, main barriers uh, can be it's policy and regulatory in some countries. It's um, distance. Those mountains you saw in Georgia. That was a tough one. We actually, some of those horses, one horse fell <laughs> and the equipment fell. <laughs> uh, the horse was fine. The equipment wasn't. We had to fix the equipment. And Philip, uh, like many, knows how to um, work on the spot and do a hack with some equipment. Um, we, uh, they helped, uh, we had to replace that solar panel that fell, but um, it can be um, geography. It can be mindset. And Philip, this is something that is so critical is that some people just can't get their minds around the fact that a local community could run a network and they think of it as, well, how does that work in the grander scheme of things? I forgot to mention that for some um, traditional operators, there isn't a return on investment the, with the lower the number of humans in a certain community. We've heard that it's 5,000 and under. That's a lot of people who live in communities of 5,000 and under and or different pockets of a city. So um, these networks can scale both economically and from a technical infrastructure perspective quickly. And that was one of the things we saw with New York City Mesh. They were running across the rooftops of New York City during COVID in an agile fashion that others couldn't do because they might have business plans that are too heavy um, to have pivoted during COVID. And so New York City Mesh was able to do that, Saranta Boro and some others that we know. 
So um, good question, Philip. We have a slide that I didn't show here of some of those barriers to connectivity. And, it, and again, it can be regulatory governance, it can be existing rules and regs, and it can just be mindset um, and or geography, like I said. Yeah, to pick up on that, I, I thought it was interesting to see your slide that talked about the pillars of community network, policy regulator and regulatory backhaul knowledge, know how uses and sustainability and it just struck me that those are uh, the pillars of, of sustainable internet exchange points as well. Uh, and you mentioned that the, the overlap in, in uh, sort of principle between community networks and exchange points. Do you want to explain a little bit how that works and if community networks work with IXPs, et cetera? It's a great question, Nirani. Um, New York City Mesh is actually um, peering at the uh, DKICS exchange in New York City. The GUIFI um, network um, peers with CATIX in Barcelona. IXPs can be great partners because many of the um, networks need to reach broader um, internet connectivity and other peers. And this is a way to do that. Um, you could actually look at it as a CSR perspective from an I, if you were a big IXP, um, allowing them to come in and peer so that they can exchange traffic with others. So there are good synergies there. It's, it's known. Um, those are the two examples that come to mind for me right now. Others are working to interconnect through bigger networks like a, a research and education network. And um, I give a shout out to the Network Startup Resource Center as well. NSRC, Steve Huter and team, um, Philip and others are doing great work on um, uh, whether it's a WAN or a local um, uni network with the NREN. Uh, this is a high complementary um, activity with community networks. And actually my colleague Dawit Bekele in Ethiopia is engaged in discussions right now with a research and education network in a place called Bahardar. Um, it's about an hour flight outside of uh, Addis. So this is, um, there are great partnerships that can be had and there's a lot of capacity available right now on networks uh, yeah. and then networks, yeah. yeah great, great answer. Uh, uh, I'll encourage other people to, to pop their questions in the Q and as well, but uh, I'll throw a few more at you as well, if you don't mind. Um, so, Maybe more, if we take it, go back and talk about it more concretely, if, if people who've watched this presentation say, this is great, I think we could uh, do this ourselves, where should they start? How do they go about? They can connect with us and we can connect them with others. It depends on if there's um, networks in the region that we can introduce them to, too. We never want to be a single point of failure as a partner in anything we do. So it's really um, about scaling work by introducing people to each other. The GitHub site that um, New York City Mesh has is excellent. I know Guifi, if you're a Spanish speaker, has excellent resources. Again, it's this network of humans and organizations and um, and even government officials who are keen to see this happen um, in their regions, um, we can introduce them to them or we can introduce uh, them to other people that can introduce them to other people. Great, but do you have like, is there like a startup kit or something uh, on the we ISOC website or <laughs> resources? We have a handbook that we're working on that's specific to Africa, and then we're working on a study on the impact of community networks. So we do have some resources on our website, and we've got some resources on our Indigenous Community Summit landing page that we could definitely point people to. Um, and actually, we have a whole training series that we did on Zoom last year to prepare for the Indigenous Connectivity Summit. So that's almost eight weeks of training. We did eight weeks of training, so it's eight different um, Clips, Zoom clips, we're talking everything from grants to policy regulatory to network design to human networking design <laughs> to how to keep going, a, even if you're starting at a low level of funding. So there are all sorts of different aspects of community networks that are highlighted in those videos. And our colleagues at APC also have a getting started guide that was um, in a publication that came out at the Internet Governance Forum um, several years ago in Paris, good case studies. We're finding that case studies are important because people can listen, they can observe and then think about how that might apply in their community and then go contact those um, folks directly. We don't, again, want to be uh, in the way. We want to connect people directly if possible. Yeah, and I guess that comes back to what you were saying about the mindset that that seeing other, uh, listening to other stories also actually might convince people that you don't have to be a network engineer or you might not even work in the internet, but if these people over here could do it, maybe we can do it in our community as well. 
Absolutely. And it was really interesting um, in the in Greece, um, there are clips that we have from Vasilis that show people sitting in a training session learning how to crimp fiber real time. Um, and other sessions that we've done on the ground with uh, a shout out again to another group we've worked with is the um, International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP, Marco Zanaro and um, another colleague from Venezuela there have been working hard on how to do spectrum training. So we were absolutely right. able to do a theoretical spectrum training session and then a very practical session with them to actually put a network together simulated in a classroom. This was during um, one of the AFPIF meetings, I believe. And then after that, we took that out into um, Kibera, a community in Kenya. So we did the simulation in a room, went out, had the theoretical training, did the practical and actually deployed the network. Fantastic. Yeah. I see a great question from Avri Doria. Good to see you here, Avri. Uh, She's asking, can community networks be used to circumvent internet shutdowns? Is there any research being done on that? It's a good question, Avri. I think they can be used to keep connectivity going um, in a shutdown situation. We've got a new uh, landing page um, uh, platform on measuring the health of the internet and shutdowns is one of the things we've been focused on. You definitely could keep people connected during a shutdown. Um, it's really important, of course, to make sure that you're running networks over borders because um, you've got to have redundancy and resiliency. Uh, just like an IX, you want your networks to uh, the ISPs and the CDNs to have a redundancy plan. Um, countries need to think about this too. So it goes to both the micro level of connectivity during a shutdown, but a macro level of making sure that global, that your infrastructure from a local and regional perspective is robust. Because um, yeah, at the end of the day, it comes back to what kind of connection you have to the outside world, so to speak. So make sure you have um, a diversity in your connectivity. Absolutely, Nirani. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so another question from Desiree Milosevic. Uh, oh, thanks, Jane, for a great presentation. Another familiar face in here. I'm familiar with the work uh, over the years, but has the approach changed to have an organic growth rather than a targeted growth? of community networks? So good question, Desiree. And it has changed over the years because we were just in um, working in Asia and started to scale the work more in 2016. We actually went to a meeting in um, Bogota, Colombia it's called the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance. And someone said to me inside the organization, why are you going to a spectrum meeting? I said, it's not just about spectrum. <laughs> it's about innovative use of spectrum, everything from TV white space to unlicensed spectrum and changing the way we look at spectrum um, and a, providing spectrum to complementary networks like the smaller networks. But we have gone from an organic approach, but it is targeted. We have certain places where we're working. We also want to make sure that we're supporting partners in other places. So um, often we are asked though about scale. Oh, these are small networks, they'll never scale. The Georgia project is a, is a case in point which shows that it is scalable. The network in Tusheti scaled in that region. Then it's gone to the economic development um, entity in Georgia was working with the ministry, the ISP association, our local chapter, and one of our local champions, Ucha Saturi. Ucha is a force to be reckoned with. He's an amazing human being. He has galvanized the community and the economic development agency in Georgia to, to look at other regions and to take the model, replicate it, take the model and try and replicate it. And that's where we've seen where we start to take a, seat as a, a step back and others come in and provide funding. It's very much like the apricot model. Um, I know Philip's on the call where we look where you, apricot from what I understood went from, which is a network operator group meeting. You went from three or four partners getting something started to many partners and then self sustainability of an, of a thing like the network operator group and self funded by partners and by itself with charging that sort of model where people come in, get something started, bring in more resources, bring in that sustainability, but we pull back a little while others come in so that the broad base of the pyramid is strong. It's not just one or two partners. Again, no single points of failure. Mm, very good, good point. Um, I see another question from Raquel Gato. Uh, thanks also for the presentation, Jane. Could you mention some 
countries, if any, that have adopted good policy examples embracing community networks? <laughs> well, Raquel is a lovely friend and colleague uh, from Brazil, and her country has put in some fabulous new rules and regs, Brazil, last February about community networks and complementary forms of access. Brazil has led the way along with Mexico, um, really. And um, it, from my perspective in Georgia, if those three countries have put rules and regs in place or they've removed barriers, allowed people to be innovative, to think outside the box, to actually test, do a beta test or two, as you might say. Um, but going back to Raquel's specific question, I would say Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, different rules and regs are being put in place to allow these networks to grow and experiment and see where they can give them different types of licensing. Um, so thank you, Raquel, for bringing that up because it's really important. Um, mm. I know other organizations like APC are working in different environments to see if they can help shift change. Kenya and Uganda as well last year put some rules and regs in place. Zimbabwe has just done this as well with some um, spectrum allocation uh, rules, but also they allowed the network called Morimbindo Works, which is outside of Harare, to exist. They really mm. took a, a close look as a regulator and they have um, really done some great innovative work to look at complementary forms of access. So this is shout out to all of those entities and Canada's also been a great partner here as well. That, that's such a, an important point. And again, that also applies to exchange points that you can have the best people on the ground, you can build the best network or exchange point or community. But if the regulatory environment makes it difficult for people to build their networks or to appear or even for the IXP to, to come about, then, then all that becomes very hard. Uh, I see that the, there's a question in relation to that. Peter Mbando uh, is saying that uh, he wants to add that the, on the obstacles that hinders community networks is lack of friendly policies from governments, especially regulatory bodies. So how does, how does ISOC uh, collaborate with governments to ensure that community networks technology is adapted and implemented at large. So we often work directly with governments to talk about the advantages of community networks, lay out what we've, some of what we've discussed here. We go into greater depth on some of the issues, but it really is working one-to-one. -one. It can be through people like um, Raquel in the region, or it can be um, through partners like APC who we, amp we amplify messaging together on certain things that or with NSRC, where we all know that there are certain factors that we want to promote, whether it's better universal service funding um, rules and regs, because those are locked in with the old telco model. Mm -hmm. Different licensing from social purpose licensing that Mexico paved the way with, it's working with people like a fellow named Eric Huerta, who went in and met with the Mexican government many times with the regulator. Um, the regulator took a chance because they've been working very, um, very closely with community radio. And so community networks weren't, wasn't so far a stretch for them, but it really right. is advocacy. It's strong advocacy. It's, it's through case studies and informing. It's often just educating regulators and We've seen more traction in some um, emerging markets than we have in more developed markets because some people are locked into their systems. And so it really is about advocacy and lobbying in some instances, which is um, you know, something we uh, have to be careful with where we are, wherever we are, to make sure we're within the parameters of the rules. Because a lot of countries, if you come in to talk to government officials about a specific issue, you've got to work within the rules in that country. So we're always very mindful of that. But you do have to... Also, I think for, Peter, for Peter's benefit, some of the case studies that you'll find um, that we'll be putting up on our website that APC has um, can show other governments that it's not new it's, and that mm -hmm. other governments will realize that it's not taking a high risk, that it's something that exists, that there have been regulatory measures taken, whether it's Brazil, Kenya, Uganda, or Argentina, that there are prototypes out there that they could take a look at and other government, government officials they can talk to and that mm. we could actually help put them in touch through other partners. So, so uh, in relation uh, or on that note, because I know, again, I think case studies is, is important in those uh, scenarios as well, getting governments to understand what has been done in different in other countries and, and hearing the stories of those communities. But I was wondering about, uh, again, I'm trying to link it to the IXP um, 
community. I know that ITOC has done studies, for example, on, on growth of IXPs and the role of IXPs in certain countries and how that has changed um, the, the landscape in, in that country. Uh, are you doing similar work or are you planning to do similar work with community networks to sort of on a more, in a more tangible way, sh measure the impact of community networks? We are, and I would point um, people to a study we did with Carlos Ray Moreno, who wrote the study for us um, in 2017. That's on the African uh, community network environment. The case studies will be coming out that will have more pointed data, but we are working right now in Irani with an expert um, uh, whose name is Heather Hudson, who's done a lot of work um, in Canada on community empowerment and community networks, working with her on an impact assessment report, like how you can look at a network that we've worked with or a partners have worked with and assess what that impact has been. Um, we're also trying to get some of that data with um, our partner Ucha Satori in Georgia um, to show the impact. Some of it is quantitative and much of it is qualitative. Quotes yeah. from people about how their lives have changed quotes from government officials who have said, wow, that was really, not wow, but okay. It was a really good thing to do to work with uh, the community network um, and to change things. Because one thing I wanna highlight is that if you're using old rules and regs that were built around networks that were only bilateral networks, that isn't really the internet model of networking where small, medium and large size networks are networked to each other. You've gotta have rules and regs that are a little bit more flexible that address how to promote them, fund mm -hmm. them, license them because universal service is broken in some countries and you can barely get the funding out to normal network uh, the old traditional networks but the question is how would you get them out to a community network can you break that log jam because right now people need to get connected mm -hmm. uh, the internet's been a lifeline and if it takes two years to get an allocation for a license or funding you've missed the mark yeah and i think it would be interesting to see if there's an increased understanding of the importance of the internet now after the pandemic that, well, that we're still in, unfortunately. Um, because I think, um, you know, technology is one of those things that uh, until you have it, you might, you know, you don't really understand the potential of it. Um, we didn't perhaps think that it was possible to, to have a whole organization just work remotely or to educate our children remotely or, or to, to, you know, have, like I have my, my mother read to my kids uh, once a week over, over FaceTime. And, you know, so, so those are um, things that when you are forced to actually use technology or when you get the opportunity to use technology, that's when it opens up, um, you know, the potential opens up for you. It, it does. And um, I would, I would just say also that the potential opens up and then people can also see the opportunities for them, whether it's for business or education, as you're saying, or for just how to continue to innovate in their own communities. Um, businesses start up, uh, schools change the way they work, as you know, um, but also people start to see a bit more hope in what's in how to connect and they they really need to connect to each other especially now during covid another yeah. thing that's been really interesting about one network in um outside of cape town um uh, that a university has helped start i don't want to misspeak on that one um they have been able to post more information and zenzeleni the network in the eastern cape not so close to Joburg, but nearby um has been able to post information about COVID for the local people because there's a lot of misinformation. So they've had message boards for the community that have been mm -hmm. able to amplify sort of good practices, what's going on. And it's been another way that you show the value of a community network for that community network and people become yeah. more invested and sustain it. Yeah, great. Um, so I'll, I'll take a last question from the audience and, and then I'd like to look forward as well a little bit. So uh, Jim Prendergast, uh, going back to, to the regulatory uh, aspects of it, so saying that the, during the most recent IQ Plenty Pot, there was pushback from some countries against language that would encourage the deployment of community networks, as they claimed they didn't know what the term community network meant, or would never heard of them. Is there any work underway to help these countries and their regulators 
better understand and appreciate them. And thank you, Jim, for the question. Um, I was there too, and Jim knows I have the scars, as do some of my other colleagues um, from other organizations. We do indeed. <laughs> oh boy. Um, you know, just a shout out to the ITD development sector and Doreen Bogdan, who's the first woman to ever be the head of that D sector in 150 something years. She was elected at that plenipotentiary. And I think what we saw at that plenipotentiary, and many of you know that people will use something like community networks as a negotiating tool. We became the beach ball in the room. Um, rather than focusing on development and connectivity, it was used as a tool to um, get what people wanted on cybersecurity or over the top mm -hmm. services, OTT. So what really was amazing after that was the energy that the development sector put into working with ISOC, with APC, with an organization called A4AI and local governments to talk about the importance of community networks at their global symposium for regulators, which was literally right after um, the year after the plenipotentiary. Also, mm -hmm. there is um, study work and, and exploration and research going on in the study uh, areas in the ITUD, the development sector. I'm a vice rapporteur in one question. There's a fabulous uh, woman from the regulator in Zimbabwe who leads another question of rural remote. We've been able through um, Article 19, APC, ISOC and others, a for ai to come in and work through the D sector, development sector, to educate people more about community networks. And we've brought in case studies, we've put in contributions, we've um, provided more data, and we've also put that into this rural question. So we've also, um, through a local a study on local um, access networks, last mile networks that John Garrity, APC and others got started. We added a little data too. We can't take credit for that study. It's really, I saw um, the ITU and um, APC that got it, got it going and John um, brought it home. That last mile connectivity study showed that um, community networks are a viable complementary solution. Not the end all be all, not an alternative for some, but a complementary solution. So Jim, a lot of work has been done and also um, partners like our chapter in Brazil have been working with the Brazilian government. Um, we've been talking to many governments through CITEL where colleagues like Diego Canabera and Christian O'Flaherty and uh, Juan Perano have done training from everywhere from Bolivia, specific training in Bolivia to training for 30 something governments through CITEL. And so we have plans to do um, with our partners to also go to other regional um, orgs like ATU, APT, to talk about the importance of community networks. And also the African Telecommunication Union and the African Union last year had a series of workshops and seminars, webinars um, with Mozilla, with ISOC, with Steve Song and APC to educate um, different government officials and um, other experts on everything from spectrum to licensing to community networks to other. So there's been um, a great grassroots, both bottom up and also bringing it from the top um, with these orgs to kind of meet in the middle to talk about the importance of connectivity and what community networks can do so that it's not seen as something so um, foreign or new to them at the next Plenty Putt <laughs> or the World Telecom Development Conference, which will come up in the fall. Thank you so much for that, Jane. And thank you to all of you who participated and asked all these great questions to Jane. Um, there's more information on the ISOC website and I'm sure Jane is happy to uh, receive any emails from you who need to find out more about community networks. It's a very interesting uh, initiative that I'm sure we'll see more of in the future. So thank you so much, Jane. Thank you to all of you who participated. Please do keep an eye out on the LINCS website and YouTube channel for any upcoming presentations and tutorials. And with that, I'd like to again give a very special thanks to Jane for taking the time to share this great presentation about this fantastic initiative. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to your talk. So with that, I will bid you all farewell, be well, stay healthy and stay safe and hope to see you all very soon again. <laughs>